A uh, few years ago, I inherited a snowblower. Can I tell you something? I love my snowblower. And I'm pretty sure as my neighbors looked out the window this week on Monday specifically, they love my snowblower too. And uh, so my snowblower is so amazing. You know, in the last six years that I've had it, someone gave it to me after I had back surgery. They're like, I think this will help. And I'm like, my life is complete now. And I just remember, so in six years, we've lived in three different homes in two different cities. And so every time we were in a new place, uh, I had this habit of not just, you know, snowblowing our driveway and sidewalk, but I just keep going. It's just like, it just, it just drives me as I'm just going, I'm just like, you know, three, four, five houses down, do the neighbor's driveways. Like, I love doing it. In fact, you know, my neighbors have actually, you know, past neighbors from Toronto and other streets, right? They're like, we really miss your snowblower. And I'm like, you mean you miss us? Like, now we just miss your snowblower, right? Like, it was awesome, and they really appreciated it, but it was this really neat thing. And, you know, as much as people would talk really nicely about it, it's, oh, thanks so much, they come out, they'd be like, wow, it's so generous of you. Thank you so much for clearing the driveway. Thanks for, you know, whatever. I'm like, it didn't really, it didn't really cost me much, to be honest, right? Like, a little bit of time, a very little bit of gasoline. The fact is, is it was far less sacrifice and far more delight, because when we first got it, we had a newborn, and so when it snowed, all of a sudden it was like, oh, babe, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll go clear the snow now for, you know, an hour, hour and a half, two hours. All of a sudden, I had a little bit of freedom. I got to go outside in the fresh air and bask in the aroma of a very inefficient two-stroke engine. I got to listen to one or two or three episodes of my favorite true crime podcast. I got fresh air. I got some exercise. I got the endorphins flowing. I was the envy of every single seven-year-old who walked by in a onesie snowsuit as they heard the roar of my favorite power tool and thought, I want to be like him when I grow up. I said, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. How sacrificial do you think I am? What did that cost me? Not much. A little bit of time, which I quite delighted in. It was very little personal sacrifice. Now, the neat thing is, is you kind of saw my wife knows me quite well. And so when I came in the door, <laughs> she wasn't thinking sacrifice. There was nobody there waiting at the door thinking, oh, hon, you must be so tired. Can I give you a shoulder rub? Here's a cold beer. That never happened. It was, here's a crying baby. I'm going to take a nap, right? That's how this, the, the, went, rea the reality is, right? Now, I'm not telling that story to shame you if you like, you know, love lawn mowing or snow blowing and now I've just outed you and now all of a sudden it's like you're not as sacrificial because now they know that you're really just escaping and delighting. Listen, I'm not telling that story to, to out you at all. I'm telling you that story because there's a principle at play that we'll unpack near the end of the message today that is critical to being a Jesus follower. And so today in the story, we're gonna bump up against this idea. And by the time you leave, you're gonna understand what snowblowers have to do with following Jesus. And some of you for the first time in your life are actually intrigued to get to the end of the message. It's gonna be awesome, okay? So today we're gonna go through one of the most famous stories in Jesus' life. It's called the Good Samaritan. You've heard that phrase. You don't even have to be a church person or a Christian. You've heard of organizations and charities. You've even heard of laws called Good Samaritan laws. You didn't even know it was a religious principle. You didn't know it came from Jesus, but it did. And you know, for some of you, it's like this is the first time you're hearing the actual story. And for others of you, you're hearing this for the hundredth time and you're thinking, what else is there to learn, right? Like this is the story of the Good Samaritan. But here's the really cool thing about Jesus' words. The, the words of God. And so even though we're 2,000 years later, and even though you've heard the story, I just have this experience over and over and over again where the words of God just continue to pierce my heart and challenge me. It doesn't matter how many times I've heard the story. There's always something that leaves me challenged. And so today, if we can just jump into Luke chapter 10, verse 25, I'd love to go through this story with you and discover a new challenge and be encouraged on the way. On one occasion, an expert in the law a religious expert in the law, not like a lawyer, like a, but some, you know, call it like a religious lawyer, uh, stood up to test Jesus. Okay, so he's gonna ask Jesus a question. But the question is not to find out a genuine answer. It's like to test him. Some of you, it's like, this is like a family gathering, right? It's like, there's lots of questions, but nobody actually wants an answer. They're just testing you or pushing you, right? Some of you are like, this is social media. It's like, there's all these questions in the comment area, but it's like, they don't actually want the answer. They just want to fight right? That's the moment that we're in in this moment. So feel the emotion of those moments or online. Think of that when you think of this moment, okay? So he's there to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life sounds kind of churchy. Um, you might call that the afterlife. Uh, just 
throw this out there, maybe new to faith or, you know, what do you guys believe here? We believe in an afterlife. We believe that we were all created to live forever in relationship with Jesus. And we exist to help people begin relationships with Jesus. And so we're all about that. Um, we're not, I'm not gonna go on that whole sermon today, but I just want you to know that, that that's something that's really important to us here. Um, but here's some important details to think about, you know, eternity and the afterlife. Often you think about that, maybe because of church experience or Hollywood, you often see the afterlife or eternal life as floating around on heart, on clouds, playing harps. And when Jesus spoke about eternity, heaven, you know, all that, he didn't talk in those words. He, he called it eternal life. He called it new creation. He called it the kingdom of heaven. And I love the way Robin described the kingdom of heaven last week. It was where life is lived as God intended it. That it's not this airy, fairy, floating around, half conscious. It's like, no, it's very real. And it's the way that God intended life to be. And the interesting thing is when Jesus talks about it, it's not clouds and harps. It's a radically new vision of the world. And whenever Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and paints a picture, it's, it's just incredible to see how he's painting the world. And it actually seems very real, not airy, fairy. And it's kind of nuanced because, you know, often we hear eternal life and we think, so after we die, we begin eternal life. But for the ancients, when they said eternal life, they meant life to the full in this life and the one to come. That's for some Christians, a new concept, right? Maybe you grew up in a, you know, a realm of Christianity that was always about like, you know, this world's going to hell in a handbasket, but one day we're gonna get to escape and go to heaven. And it's like, no, as Jesus followers, we believe that heaven is actually new creation. And Jesus kind of used these word pictures of it's now and it's not yet. It's like a sunrise, it's coming. We're a part of it and yet it's coming, it's near. It's at, the, it's at our doorstep, it's really close by. It's now and not yet. And yet some Christians, it's like, no, this world doesn't matter. It's all about the next life. And I kind of think about it, maybe you've raised teenagers and they're like in high school and it's like, they have no vision beyond high school, right? It's like, they're just living day to day and you're constantly trying to drill, drill in your child's head. It's like, no, no, no. The decisions you make now will impact the rest of your life. You don't graduate high school and then all of a sudden everything gets erased and you start fresh. Like that actually impacts and matters to the trajectory of your life. And the same would be true about eternal life. It's now and forever. And what we do and the decisions we make impact us now in this life and the life to come, to live life in its fullness now and forever. So eternal life is living life to the full now and forever. So he brings this up though, not because he's curious about eternal life, but because he's trying to trap Jesus. It's a test. And Jesus responds, not with an answer, but with another question, which is a brilliant way to respond to someone who's just trying to antagonize you. What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Now that's an interesting question, right? Jesus doesn't just say what's written in the law or what's written in the Bible. He has a follow-up question, which is how do you read it? How do you understand it? You know, many of you, you maybe grew up and I've said this so often and I love the heart behind it, but I think it's misleading. We say something like, you know, the Bible says it, that settles it. Now, I love the posture of that because we're saying, listen, these words are significant and they should impact our life. But Jesus adds a step in between the Bible says it, that settles it. He adds a step, which is, how do you understand it? For Jesus, it's the Bible says it, how do you understand it? Those two questions that are gonna be up on the screen are really important for Jesus because the reality is it can say something, but you can misunderstand it. And some of you are like, does that ever happen? Oh yeah, read world history. There's lots of times the Bible said something and they misunderstood it. So Jesus says, hey, what are you reading the Bible? Oh, and, and help me understand, how are you understanding it? Because that's where the whole conversation is gonna be based on. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. He was actually quoting a verse from the book of Deuteronomy. Love your God, love Lord God with, with everything. And he says this, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was also from the law, the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. So he's quoting the scriptures back at Jesus. And Jesus is like, great job. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. In fact, not only did he answer correctly, he answers with the answer that Jesus often gave. In fact, this isn't the first time Jesus gets tested. There's other times where people come up to Jesus, they're like, hey, hey, Jesus, what's the most important law in, in the scriptures? Like, what's the most important law? And Jesus, instead of answering with one, always gives two, right? He's like, he answers this exactly this way. Love Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's like, they ask for one, and he gives them two. Why? Because some things are so complex, they cannot be simplified beyond a certain amount. Ask me who my favorite child is. My kids ask me all the time. Papa, who's your favorite? Am I your favorite? Of like, yeah, my favorite's Grayson and Kaya. It's like, but who's your favorite? Grayson and Kaya. 
It's like, but can you give us one? Yes, Grayson and Kaya, right? It's like, you cannot bring it simpler. And for God, it's like, like, you wanna know the most important thing? It's loving God and loving people. And which one's most important? Loving God and loving people. You cannot detach the two. To love God is to love people. The two go together. The way I always explain to people is, you can't love me and treat my kids poorly. Impossible. You can tell me I'm awesome. You can write songs about me. You can tell me, Mark, we love you. You're wonderful. We worship your holy name and treat my kids like garbage. That doesn't count. Because if you love me, you will love those who are dear to me. The two go together. And so when Jesus is pushed, what's the most important thing? He's like, it's that you love God and you love others. You cannot love God and not love others because those are all his children. Everybody in the world is God's child. And if you're gonna love God, you're gonna love others. Some of you, maybe you're not even church people. Maybe you've felt this contradiction where you've met religious people who seem so spiritual. They're always you know, doing spiritual things. They're fasting, they're praying, they're at church, they're singing, hands up, crying, all this stuff. Like, but they're just jerks to people. And if you've ever felt like that was a contradiction, it's because it was. And Jesus agrees with that contradiction. He says, you cannot love God and not love people. You can't love me and hate my kids. Love God love people. At Lakeside, we have this phrase that we use to summarize this, deep faith, wide embrace. The deeper our faith grows in Jesus, the deeper our relationship with Jesus grows, the wider our embrace for everybody that we encounter gets. So back to the story. This is what Jesus says in response to this man bringing up these two things, love God, love people. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just, didn't he just ask about eternal life and how do you inherit eternal life? And then the answer is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, wait, don't you mean when the pastor, you know, has an altar call and the music's really emotional and you come forward with tears in your eyes and you repeat after him and you're not sure what's happening, but then you go back and you get a Bible and you write the date of the day that you said the prayer. Isn't that how you get eternal life? Jesus is like, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's interesting. There's a great conversation at lunchtime and I wish we'd go on that tangent, but I'm, I'm staying on track today, okay? But Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's not just simply words that you repeat. It's about a whole life reoriented in a new way where God is everything to you and you're constantly living out of that relationship. But he wanted to justify himself. Let's get back to the situation at hand. He wanted to justify himself. This is the legal expert. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, something's really interesting happening here because when he quoted that verse, remember the love your neighbor as yourself, he was quoting Leviticus 19, verse 18. Can I read it for you? Let me read the whole verse. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. So this was written to Jews. And so it was like, so don't, don't seek revenge amongst other Jews, but love your neighbor as yourself. I'm the Lord. Okay. Now, how Jews interpreted this passage was they conflated those two ideas and they said, your neighbor is your fellow Jew. So when we are called to love our neighbors, we are called to take care of our family and our friends, our fellow Jews. That's where it stops. And so when the religious leader is testing Jesus, he's like, and who's my neighbor? Because he's been watching Jesus and Jesus' love is so much broader than just the Jewish people. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus is constantly getting in trouble with the kinds of people he associates with and loves. And the religious leader shows up and he's like, "Uh uh-uh, I don't think you're reading the Bible right. And so he's like, so who do you say neighbors are? Because we know who the neighbors are. It's our fellow Jews, but you have a much broader view of love than we do. And so he's testing him and he's pushing him in this moment. This guy is challenging Jesus' interpretation of the scriptures and the way he lived. He's basically saying, love your neighbor isn't for everyone, it's for our fellow Jews. Here's how I would summarize what's happening in this story right now. A religious person is using a religious text to draw lines around who we should love. Sound familiar? That's what's happening in this moment. You gotta love it. It's this loaded question, who's my neighbor? And Jesus responds, with the story. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. That's a very real road. And it was actually known as the, like one of the translations, like the road of blood. It was a very dangerous road. And so this is not uncommon. He's like, hey, I just wanna tell you a story. He makes up a story to make a real point, right? He was attacked by robbers. Um, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest 
happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, the interesting thing is the religious leader, the law expert, actually there's, there's potential that he was actually a priest. So there is a potential that Jesus is actually writing him into the story. And he's like in the priest, by the way, so it may be referring to him, walk by on the other side. So to a Levite, which is a priest's assistant, okay? So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Okay, so two people have now ignored him. In a sense, you could say Judaism had two chances to help this person who was suffering and both missed their opportunity. But a Samaritan. Now we talked two weeks ago about a Samaritan and the racial tension that had gone on for hundreds of years between Jews and Samaritans. They hated each other's guts, Right, like they did, they wanted nothing to do with each other. They had hate crimes in history that were recorded against each other. Um, you know, there were actually like cultural rules. Like if you saw a Samaritan woman giving birth, you were not allowed to help because you were responsible for bringing one of them into the world. You know, they had they had prayers that the Jewish people would pray, the Jewish men would pray. Thank God I'm not a woman, a dog, or a Samaritan. That was their prayer. Think of how horrible they hated each other. And so Jesus just slides this in. So like two weeks later, he comes back to this idea of the Samaritans. He's like, but a Samaritan, and it's just like, whoa. Where's this going, Jesus? He's going there. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any, highlight and underline, any extra expense you may have. This costs the Samaritan dearly. He binds up the man's wounds. I don't know about you, but when I go for a walk and a journey, I don't have like a full first aid kit with tourniquets and everything in it. What did he do? He would have probably had to cut up his clothes to bandage this man's wounds. Then he gives him oil and wine. There's no, there's no on the runs on this journey. Like if you didn't pack your food, you don't have any. He packed food and now he's giving his food to this person who's suffering. He's now gonna go without. Gives him his donkey and now he's walking. The money, some people have estimated, should cover about 24 days worth of care. Think of how much that would cost you to cover someone's care for 24 days. And then at the end, he says, and do whatever else and I'll pay for any extra expense. Friends, this is before OHIP, Okay. Like, I don't know about you, but when's the last time you said, hey, just doesn't matter, whatever it costs, just fix that or fix them. How often do you say that? Let's just agree on two things. Number one, you don't say that very often. And two, it's usually related to yourself or a loved one. Yeah, I know they're in trouble. Do whatever it takes to help them. Or yeah, I know, but hey, whatever it's gonna cost, whatever the medical bill is, whatever it is, right? Like you've had this moment. It's a life-saving surgery. It's a dangerous situation. They need to fly home tonight, dying relative, journey home, time off work, right? Like it's very rare that we say whatever the cost. It's usually something that's very urgent and very dear to our hearts and someone who's very dear to our hearts. Here's the bottom line of the story. What is normally done for self is done for a complete stranger. That is completely radical. And then Jesus asked this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, oh, sorry, uh, robbers. Uh, oh, we missed a verse. Okay, I'm just gonna read you verse 37. My apologies. Uh, verse 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. You know what's happening there? He refuses to say the word Samaritan. He's so disgusted by this story, he won't even call him who he is. It's like the one who had mercy on him. It's like a child. Do you ever have a kid who's trying to say sorry? And it's like, sorry. It's like, what's happening in this moment. Refuses to even say his name. What's Jesus saying in this moment? Hey, bud, that law that you memorized, that you taught, that you sought to live, I'm telling you, the person that you think is least qualified can do a better job than you. Ouch. Here's my favorite part of the story. The man in the ditch has been stripped naked. You know what that means? There's no way to signify where he was from, who he was, if he was educated, uneducated, if he's to blame for this, if he made an unwise decision, if he brought this upon himself, Jesus gives zero details of how the men ended up in the ditch. So no details can be used to discriminate against whether he deserves help or not. 
And yet 2,000 years later, we, myself included, love making excuses as why we won't help certain people or why we can't. You know, it's brought upon themselves or it's their own, you know, poor cho- choices, consequences for their actions. It's not my problem. On and on it goes. For Jesus, if you can see them, you can help them. For Jesus, if you can see them, you can help them. I love the way N.T. Wright summarizes this whole story. And Annette's just gonna go back two slides. I apologize for jumping back and forth. But for the lawyer, God is the God of Israel and neighbors are Jewish neighbors. That's how he saw the world. For Jesus, Israel's God is the God of grace for the whole world and a neighbor is anyone in need. I wanna spend the last few minutes together, just giving you four different areas that maybe this story is speaking to you. And here's the question I want you to wrestle with. How does this passage challenge and inspire you? I don't know about you, but I've always heard this story. You know, you get to the end and it's like, so how can you be a good Samaritan? You know, how can you do better? How can you sacrifice more? Um, We'll talk about that. But can we just acknowledge that point number one is this, this is good news for those who feel they're in the ditch of life. Think of the original hearers of this story would have always experienced these religious leaders who would only care for their own friends, their own family, and their own people. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 this God calls us to care for all people. Just think of how that would have emotionally impacted anyone who found themselves in a metaphorical ditch in their life, that all of a sudden there's good news for you that if people were genuinely living, fully alive, this eternal life response to the love of God, you would be cared for. Some of you have never had a good Samaritan come to you in your life. You've only had religious lawyers. You experienced someone who loved their interpretation of the Bible, but didn't love their neighbor. And can I just say, I'm sorry. That's on us. And if we have not shown love or put boundaries around who we can love, that's not on Jesus, that's on us. And we cannot claim to have loved and yet done that. So for those of you maybe today who are feeling like you're in the ditch, in Jesus's kingdom, when everything is going the way God has planned, you are cared for. And can I just tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm relatively new to this church. I've been here about four years And yet I've been so blown away by this community and their desire to care for people, to really fight for healing for people. And so if you're new here and you're feeling honestly like like you're just in the ditch of life, today I'm not telling you this story so you feel like you gotta pull your bootstraps up and work harder and serve harder and sacrifice more and it's gotta cost you something. Uh, I'm saying the good news of the kingdom is there's space for you to heal. And we're just so glad that you're here and please don't feel any pressure, just rest take that space. Um, If grief walk or celebrate recovery or joining a group or whatever is helpful for you, you just need to be and to heal. That's a kingdom of God thing. And we want to facilitate that for you. Second part of the story that grips me, and this is the part, and this is why I'm sharing this. This is the part that gripped me, getting back to the snowblower. For many of us, our service costs us very little. Here's the way I'd say it, just because it costs something doesn't mean it costs you. It's really easy as Christians to do good things, you know, to serve and maybe give a little bit here and do all these things. But really, it's just like, we, we love doing those things. And, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, I love the teams and servants that we have here at Lakeside. We have some incredibly uniquely gifted people who are just so passionate. You know, we have retired mechanics who come and work on our pump system and test it every two weeks. And they're just like alive as that thing roars to life and they check the oil levels and make sure everything's safe for you to be able to come to this building every week. Like, I love and we believe that you should serve in an area that you're gifted, you should feel alive and it shouldn't be a burden. But to stop there, is to miss what Jesus calls us to. You see, we are full of a culture that loves to serve and wants to make a difference, but does not want it to cost something. Charities charities have even picked up on this, right? It's like, how many times do you check out somewhere and it's like, do you want to round up to the nearest dollar to to help a charity? And it's like, they know that we want to help, but we don't really want it to cost something. And so rounding up to the nearest dollar, that really won't cost me much. So I'm happy to do it. It doesn't really cost us anything, even though there's a little cost to it. And that's fantastic. But honestly, as Jesus followers... There are times where following Jesus and loving the way Jesus did, there's gonna be a cost and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be uncomfortable. 
And the message to some of us today is maybe actually the story of the Good Samaritan is not just doing good things, but actually sometimes doing hard things and saying yes to things that will cost us and not just things that, oh yeah, that's easy. I won't even you know, miss that amount of money, but like, oh man, I'm gonna have to make some changes in my life to be committed to that kind of service or that kind of generosity or the emotional toll it would take to serve in that way. I much prefer to serve there. It's, it's really easy. In fact, it's, it's so delightful. I come home more energized and we want that. But maybe there's areas where, you know, Jesus is inviting you to actually cost something. And I'll add this caveat and we'll cover it more next week. There is a difference though between costing and breaking you. Do notice that the man had a boundary, right? He still had somewhere to go and he said, hey, you take care of him, I'm off. I don't know where he went, but he was gonna come back. But there was still something he was doing. We'll talk about that next week because it's a really awesome story coming up in the next passage. Um, but let's go on to number three. No good Samaritans without margin. Um, something I often hear as a pastor is people who just feel overwhelmed, especially with the internet and social media. It's like, Mark, I see so much wrong in the world and I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And it's just like, there's just so much coming at me. My social media feed, I see the news. I'm like, there's so many needs. I don't know where to give. I don't know what to do. I just want you to think about this. <laughs> that man did not wake up that morning with a plan for what he was gonna do, but he had two things. He had margin, financial margin and time margin. Many of us are living overextended in both those realms. We have time for nothing and money for nothing. The first thing you can do is actually start making changes in your life where you actually have some space in your life and in your finances and your material possessions to actually be generous in that way. And some of you, that is actually the first change you need because otherwise, you, you know, honestly, like I think about those two people who walked right by him, some of them probably had really valid excuses. They were busy, they were nervous, like he's half dead, the robbers are probably still close, right? They probably had a million reasons. But the Good Samaritan had time and some wealth set aside. And in that moment, he was able to act. And some of you are like, I'm not sure. I'm like, don't, don't worry. You don't have to get that all figured out. God will make it clear in the moment. But first, why don't you clear some space in your schedule so that you can actually respond to the spirit instead of just you know, responding um, or not responding at all. And then lastly, this was all about neighbor and how you define neighbor. Maybe today God's challenging your view of who my neighbor is. If your faith, the way you understand God and the way you understand scripture leads you to leaving people outside the category of being worthy of your love, you're doing it wrong. Maybe there's someone or a group of people that today God is trying to bring to mind that he's inviting you to move towards in sacrificial love. Or maybe it's not even clear how to love them, but Jesus just wants to poke on that and say, that person, that group of people, those types of people, you don't have any grace for them. And Jesus just wants to bring that to your attention. He's like, I'll deal with it later, but first you just need to acknowledge that. Maybe today you just need to bring that to Jesus and say, yeah, Jesus, I don't even know how to do it. I know it's a problem. It's been hiding below the iceberg, so to speak, for a long time. I need to work on that. And so Casey's gonna just create some space with music just to kind of let us be still and Whatever it is, maybe it's one of those four things, maybe it's something else, but can we just ask this question and we'll be still for about a minute. Holy Spirit, how are you speaking to us the story of the Good Samaritan? What are you highlighting about yourself and what are you inviting us into? Let's just be still together, friends. You want to just take a moment and write down whatever came to mind. Maybe you want to process that with a friend, a spouse, a small group this week. I just always think it's important that when God speaks, we bring it to light. It's harder to forget and easier to act on that way. Um, before you go, I just want to let you know one thing. Uh, we love welcoming people and we love blessing people as they go. And uh, one of our congregants is actually uh, moving on. His name's Casey. Casey's actually here more than six feet away from me. Uh, Casey's been a worship leader here uh, just longer than I've actually been here. One of your first weekends leading was my first weekend here. And uh, Casey did something crazy in the middle of the pandemic, went and got married, and, uh, you know, and married someone from another church. 
And uh, so, you know, as, as uh, you kind of have to figure out, are we going to go to two churches or are we going to choose? And so uh, we want to bless Vanessa and Casey today as they go. They're going to be going to Church of the City, which is a church we know and love. They actually meet at Lakeside downtown Sundays at nine. And so um, we're going to bless them in a second. But here's the thing I want to bless them with. Casey, the thing I've always loved and appreciated about the way you led worship was, and, and even in our conversations and coffees and walks and things, um, You've always had this desire and you've always lived out creating space for people to encounter God. And so I wanna bless you with that in a moment. But friends, uh, there's not a lot of us here. I don't know how many are here. It's not like what we usually have before COVID, but stand up with me for a second, okay? If it doesn't trip your weird meter, I want you to stretch your hand out and we're just gonna bless them as they go. And I'm just gonna pray over you from over here. <laughs> Normally we, we hold and hug people as we send them. But um, Casey, I just bless you that that would continue to be a theme in your and Vanessa's life. That before you even get up on stage and lead people in that way, that your home would be a place where you encounter the presence of God. That everyone who comes into that home feels the presence of God dripping off you and Vanessa. And as you serve, and as you lead, and as you give, that you continue to be known as someone who creates space for people so they can encounter the reckless love of God. You've done that for me and for us, and we bless you as you go. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Love you guys, and bless you to go. And friends, it's been fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Casey. And have a great week, my friends. Bye for now.